Well, good evening. Let me welcome everyone to another video message from Mars Hill Baptist Church. Uh, for those that are new to the video stream, my name is Daniel Gregory, and I'm pastor of Mars Hill Baptist Church here in Hillsboro, North Carolina. Let me welcome you to our time together as we study God's Word, and my hope is that the Lord blesses you greatly uh, at, during this time that we share together. Uh, a few announcements to begin. Uh, many of you have probably seen on the Facebook page already and also on the website uh, that until further notice, um, until the stay-at-home order has been lifted, all services here at the church have been canceled. Um, and I will say that it does break my heart. I really miss everyone. I've greatly enjoyed talking to everybody on the phone. And if I haven't called you yet, I promise I am getting around to it. There's a lot of phone numbers and a lot of calls to be made. Um, but for the safety of our community, uh, for our nation, and, and even the world, we are going to abide by the recommendations uh, of our government, and we're going to stay at home, and we're going to wait this out. And I promise just as soon as uh, the all clear is given and we're able to meet again, we are going to come together and worship Jesus Christ. We're going to enjoy some time together, and I promise this, I am going to be annoying when it comes to uh, telling you that we are going to be coming back together again. So please continue to look at the Facebook page as the website, as well as the website, because those are the places where we're going to be having updates on things, pictures of different things happening at the church. I know nobody's here, but we are having a little bit of work done, and uh, I will continue to try to let everybody know what all is going on. Uh, and I'll be giving out information also in the newsletter, and that's where uh, on Facebook and on the Facebook, or excuse me, the Facebook page, and also on the website is where everything is going to be um, be posted. So please keep those in mind. Uh, again, if you are not receiving an email update, the uh, the mini newsletter will be coming out tomorrow. Uh, if you have not, uh, if you're not receiving that by email with a link or uh, with that included, please let Stephanie know. Uh, you can just email her at the church's website or through the church's email address. And that way she can go ahead and as soon as that gets out, it'll get directly to you. You can look on the uh, Facebook page and also on the website. Um, but if you email Stephanie, say, hey, my name is, uh, please put my email address in and, and give that to her. She'll be happy to do that and you can receive a copy. Um, I've decided not to live stream the services because of two reasons. Um, first, I don't think the bandwidth of the church could support it. And also, um, with, with being able to record it beforehand and then edit it and post it up, I can give a much better lesson. And uh, also, I can know that uh, everything is right and everything looks good. And uh, so that way... Everybody doesn't have to worry about what time they watch or anything like that. So that's where we're going to be uh, continuing to do services for right now, just recording everything and then being able to post it back up. Um, so don't forget, there's a lot more content also on the church's website. Uh, Stephanie's been working hard at posting up all of the articles that I've written uh, over the past eight years in the church's bell. Uh, in their newsletter. So all of those are almost up. I think uh, she might have about a year's left, so that might be the most recent ones, but all of the other ones are up on the church website if, you would, uh, if you'd like to go ahead uh, and look those up. Also, the previous Sunday morning message and Wednesday night message are also posted there. Um, and if you'd like to, if you'd like to just listen to the audio, um, that is available uh, as well if you just want to listen to it. So there's a link online, um, or there's links that are uh, available there, so um, just keep those in mind. Um, all, also, to all of our faithful members who would like to continue to give to the church, uh, if you'd like to mail in your tithe or offering, you may do so uh, directly to the church. The uh, address of the church is Mars Hill Baptist Church, 1418 NC Highway 57, Hillsboro, North Carolina, 27278. I'll make sure that that gets to the right people and uh, that it'll get recorded and all, and uh, you will be credited to that in your account or in uh, in your file as 
uh, having a charitable contribution. But also let me remind everybody, if you would like to give online, um, go ahead and do that as well. Just go to the church's uh, website, and there is a link there for online giving, and you can give, and it'll go directly to you, uh, and we'll, it, your funds will be directly deposited here to the church. So just letting you know that. Um, with that, let me remind everybody, if you need me, please give me a call. Uh, I have my cell phone on me uh, all of the time. Uh, basically, the only time you can't get me through a cell phone is when I'm recording these videos. Uh, but I'm here at the church. I always have my cell phone on. So if you need me, go ahead and give me a call. If you call and I don't pick up, most likely I'm on the phone with somebody else. And I promise I'll call you right back. So if you need me to announce something or do a call them all or uh, put somebody on the prayer list, please don't hesitate. Just go ahead and, and give me a call. I'd be happy to do that. With that, let's go ahead and begin our time of worship and Bible study. I'd like to begin with the two affirmations that I gave on Sunday morning. Uh, a reminder to us all of God's presence but also that the Lord is with us in this time that, and he is going to see us through. Uh, and that if we do have a time where we are getting down, if we are feeling anxious or worried, we can say these two very simple things and that will help us to get through two things that we need not forget during this time. The two very simple true statements are this, God is with me. I will not give in to the lies of fear. God is with me. He will see me through this troubled time. Those I know are going to be up on the screen. If you want to say that with me, you can. God is with me. I will not give in to the lies of fear. God is with me. He will see me through this troubled time. The lies of fear is that this won't end. Uh, and, it, and we know it will. We know that there is going to be coming a time where we're going to be able to fellowship with one another again, and we're going to be able to get together. And through this, we are going to get the world back to normal. And we know that each and every moment of the day, God is with us. And we claim that promise that God will never leave us or forsake us, as it says in the scripture. And we claim that, that God's with us right now. Today in your prayers, uh, I do have a couple of requests that have been given to me. Um, please continue to remember the family of Hubert Bishop. Uh, his funeral was actually this past Monday in the Mars Hill Cemetery. Um, because of the order that we have to socially distance from one another, only a very few people were actually able to attend. Um, but that was this past Monday, so please be in prayer for the family. Also, if you will, please lift up Daniel and Edith and uh, all of Daniel's family in your prayers in the loss of his brother, Roy. Um, that funeral will be soon, and again, they do face the same difficulties with social distancing. But please pray for Daniel and Edith during this time, especially Daniel's family, in the loss of his brother, Roy. Um, I know also our hearts go out to all of those who have lost loved ones during this time. Uh, those, these are the times in which we, we want to get close to one another. We want to be close and we want to embrace and we want to be in fellowship, but during this time we can't. So uh, please, please, please lift up those um, that have lost loved ones that desperately want to be close with one another, um, but at this time cannot. Also, if you will, please remember Denver in your prayers. Uh, in speaking with him, he is going in tomorrow uh, for a procedure on his heart. It should be outpatient surgery, so he won't be staying overnight. Uh, but if you would, please uh, remember Denver in your prayers, uh, that all would go well and he would be able to come home quickly. Um, also, if you will, please remember the many college students that have, have gone through a very difficult time in adjusting um, with this COVID-19 going on um, and, and the world basically going on shutdown, um, especially those that are international students. 
Um, international students, um, especially those from China and where um, the coronavirus has hit very hard, are, are dealing with an especially difficult time. Um, they are a world away as they're here in the United States. And because of travel conditions, they're not able to go home. And I know many are battling a lot of anxiousness. Uh, I've spoken with somebody that works uh, closely with those that are international students. And, and because of this, unfortunately, there, there have been suicides. Uh, so please, please, if you will, remember the international students in your prayers. Uh, if the opportunity arises that you hear about a, a way to maybe help those um, that are international students, please do so, as I know they are going through so much right now. Uh, many are anxious, many are depressed, and so pray that the Lord would, would help those to receive the, the need or the, the help that they need, um, that their, their anxiousness, that their fear might be uh, brought down, that the Lord would simply intervene. Um, we want everybody healthy physically, but let us not, uh, not forget also, we want everybody healthy mentally and healthy physically. So please, please keep all of those in, uh, all those students in your prayers. Um, continue also to remember Gene in your prayers. Uh, he has not yet received um, the surgery on his heart, as was planned, uh, but he is at the top of the list right now uh, to receive that once the hospitals do those procedures again. Um, so please remember Gene in your prayers. Uh, we, know the do we know the hospitals will open, and uh, I know as soon as they do, he'll be uh, one of the ones at the top of the list to go in. Please also continue um, to remember our doctors and nurses, uh, our students. I know many of them are on spring break here in Orange County, and uh, they'll be going back on Monday, but I know many of them are still uh, doing all this work at home. It is a new world for them, and also for us parents. So please lift those up in your prayers as well. Um, also continue to remember our police and law enforcement officers uh, as they deal with everything uh, with with this outbreak. I know it's um, it's a different world for them too, and um, dealing with, with new challenges um, that they face. So please remember them. Um, also remember those that are out of work, uh, those that have lost jobs because of this crisis. Uh, pray that they would be able to find work again soon, but also that the Lord would help them uh, through this time. And of course, continue to remember our nation and our leaders as as so much is going on in the world, we're, we're hoping that they lead well, that we'll be able to get out of this crisis very, very soon. Um, if there are any other prayer requests, please don't hesitate to email me or call me. I'll be happy to get that on the prayer list for you. With that being said, let's bow in a word of prayer and ask the Lord's blessings on these requests that have been made known to us, as well as those that are on our hearts right now. Father God, as we bow before you right now. We give you thanks and praise that you are with us. Lord, it is so easy for us to be overcome by fear and anxiety, but I pray now that you'd help us to, to overcome that by knowing that, that you are here with us each and every step of the way. Lord, we lift up these that have lost loved ones that are going through this time of grief, as I know it's so difficult not being able to be surrounded by family and friends, and we pray that you would have your hand on each and every one of these that are grieving now, that you would, you would assist them through this, that you would let them know that your presence is close. Father, for our, our community, uh, for our students and our teachers and our parents, is, uh, schooling is still going on, but it, it's so different now. We pray that you would help these students to, to push through, to persevere uh, in all of their studies. And you'd also be with the teachers as they prepare lessons and send those out. And also for the parents as they adjust to children being home and, and trying to do the school work that they, that they usually do at school. Uh, Lord, help them during this time as well. For the many that have lost their jobs during this time, I pray that you would encourage their spirits and help them that if they are looking for a job, that you would allow them the opportunity and chance to, to find that new job. But also, Lord, as this, uh, as this time ends, that they might be able to re-enter the workforce, that they might begin afresh and anew. 
Lord, we also pray for our nation and we pray for our world, for the many that are sick, for the doctors and nurses that are on the front lines of all of this. Please keep them safe. And Lord, we pray for an end to this crisis very, very soon. And we lift that into your hands. And Lord, we pray your will would be done. Lord, we ask that you would help us tonight as we again look into your word. May we gain great knowledge from us from it. And Lord, may we be drawn close into your presence. For it's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, I'll encourage you to be turning back into the book of Job this evening. Job chapter 12 is where we are at. And I want to give a message entitled, Communicating Comfort Correctly. Communicating Comfort Correctly. Um, you might know the, the man's name, but uh, the author Theo Gold, who is uh, an author of a lot of uh, inspirational books, said this, Communication is your ticket to success if you pay attention and learn to do it effectively. And I thought, wow, that is a very true statement. Communication is the road in which we have to learn how to travel in order to be successful in it, whatever it is that we're doing and whatever it is uh, that we're, we're trying to do in our life, whether it's ordering food from a menu or landing a dream job that you want or even having a successful relationship with your family, with your spouse, with your friends. Communication is key. But you know what? Also, communication, counter to that, can be bad and it bring forth a lot of hurt. Some of you might remember back in 2013, Nelson Mandela, who was the first uh, black president of South Africa, he was a Nobel Prize winner, um, he was a social rights, rights act, uh, advocate, he uh, passed away when he was 95, and they were holding a memorial service for him, and a guy got on stage who was supposed to be the uh, interpreter to do sign language. And this person got up on stage, but the person had absolutely no idea how to do sign language. He was going up there, and, and everybody was outraged within the deaf, deaf community because basically all he was doing was moving his arms, not, not making any sense. Um, he did it with great vigor and great energy. He looked great because he had a suit on, and um, he, he looked like he was supposed to be up there, but basically all he was doing was the equivalent of babbling. See, he wasn't able to communicate properly. And because of that, the right message and the right things were not told. You know, as we look into the book of Job, Job had three friends, and each one of them was trying to communicate a solution to Job. They were articulate, they were well-spoken, they knew how to speak, however, they didn't know what to speak. And rather than providing comfort, they brought hurt. In our life, each and every one of us is going to have an opportunity and a chance to help somebody in need. Be it with somebody that's grieving or going through a difficult time in their life, it might be that we just want to lend them a hand and help them out of a place that they've fallen into. And those are very important times because when somebody has fallen down, when somebody's, uh, when somebody's going through a rough time in their life, they're very vulnerable. They've fallen, they're laying there, and so often those that are coming up to them with the guise of helping them are really just kicking them when they're down. So how do we help them? How do we help them when they're down. What, how do we do that? How do we communicate words of hope and words of help? Well, the words of Job in, in Job chapter 12 help us out tremendously. In, in Job chapter 12, we have Job's third reply. The, uh, in chapter 11, Zophar the Namathite, the third of Job's friends, speaks, and uh, he was a legalist as we know it, and he was the youngest, and basically he just said, you know what? I know what you've done wrong. I've got a system. I've got a plan. And you know what? You didn't follow it. And because you didn't follow it, I know what's wrong. And I know exactly what you do to make it right. See, Zophar believed that Job, that he knew Job's situation better than Job. He knew God better than Job. And he knew the solution better than anyone else. 
And for a whole chapter, he tore into Job. He tore into Job, and did it help Job at all? Not at all. And here in Job chapter 12, Job is lashing back out, saying, look, you tried to give me help, but it didn't help. You tried to do this, but let me tell you, you got it completely wrong. And Job's almost to the point where he's a little sarcastic, a little bit, a little bit cynical towards his friends and how he's explaining how wrong they are. That is why in Job, we, we have to make sure when we're looking at it, we have to make sure we take it in its context. Because a lot of things that are said here, we're like, wait a minute, why is Job saying that? And the reality is, is that Job is saying this in frustration and he's blasting his friends trying to explain to them what all they have done wrong. So tonight I want to look at Job chapter 12, verses 1 through 25. Job's reply is actually in two chapters, chapter 12 and chapter 13, but we're just going to focus on chapter 12 tonight. And, and tonight I want to look at three actions. Three actions we can take to help us as we try to communicate comfort to the hurting. Three actions we can take as we're going to help somebody, as we're trying to help somebody who is hurting, and three actions that I hope each and every one of us will take to heart as we grow in Christ and as we have these opportunities to go to those that are in need. The first one is this. Don't be a know-it-all. Don't be a know-it-all. Look at Job chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. It says this. Then Job answered and said, No doubt you are the people, and wisdom will die with you. But I have understanding as well as you. I am not inferior to you. Who does not know such things as these? I am, not a, la am, I, uh, I am a laughing stock to my friends, who called to God, and he answered me, A just and blameless land, uh, man am a laughing stock. In the thought of one who is at ease, there is contempt for misfortune. It is ready for those who, whose feet slip. The tents of robbers are at peace, and those who provoke God are secure, who bring their God in their hand. Here, Job is lashing out not only at Zophar, uh, but also at all three of his friends. And we know that uh, because of the first couple of verses. Uh, if you look and, and you mark in your Bibles, look at verses 2 and 3, and it's interesting what's said. Uh, he says, no doubt you are the people, and wisdom will die with you. But I have that understanding as well as you. I am not inferior to you. All those times Job uses the word you, it's not in the singular. He's not talking directly to Zophar. He's talking to all three of his friends that are there. Because we know in Hebrew, it's the plural. In English, we don't have any way of telling whether or not you is spelled for the singular or the plural because it's spelled the same way. But in Hebrew, it's not. So we know he's not just talking to Zophar. He's talking to Bildad and Elphaz. Excuse me, Eliphaz. And his words are not far off something we might say when we're confronted with somebody that's a know-it-all. He says in verse 2, No doubt you are the people in wisdom will die with you. Uh, basically what he's saying is this, you know when the three of you reside all the knowledge in the world, when you die, all of it's going to die with you. We're not going to have anything. Then right after that, I love what Job does. He, he, in just three or four verses, rips apart every bit of all of their arguments. Verse four, he says, I'm a just man. I prayed to God, I'm righteous before him, and God answered to me, and lo and behold, I'm a laughing stock. In verse 6, he talks about robbers being at peace and those who provoked God being secure and they have basically a God that they paid for and put in their pocket. So all this talk that you know about God is worthless. You're saying that, hey, the righteous prosper and the unrighteous have uh, all of the, all the punishment of God, but lo and behold, it's not true for we know the wicked do prosper and we do know the righteous do suffer. See, being a know-it-all only accomplishes one thing for us. It shows how little we know. Being a know-it-all shows how little we know. Rather than helping, it brings hurt. There's an interesting story from Chuck Yeager, the famed test pilot that was flying the F-86 Sabre 
Um, and as he was flying it, he, he began to have some problems. He would turn one particular way, and, and the plane would lose control. He wouldn't be able to move it like he wanted to, but he, being just an, an amazing pilot, was able to right the plane. He was able to find out what exactly was going on, what made the plane do that, and then he landed the plane. He went back to the experts that were basically going and doing all of the things that um, uh, they were building it and they were figuring out what was going on uh, with the plane. So they went in and they tried, they tried their best to figure it all out. And they figured out that there was a bolt that was installed upside down. It made it so the flaps on the wings were not able to function properly. So they tracked it all the way back down to the facility, and they tracked it down to one man. And this one man had this attitude saying, you know what? No, I'm not going to go and consult some manual. I know right from wrong, and I know exactly how that bolt is going to be put in place. The sad thing was, because of that arrogance, because of that attitude, three or four pilots perished because they couldn't gain control of the plane. Let me give you some simple truths about being a know-it-all and, and talking about the idea of how we, can, uh, how we can adjust our thinking. First is this, arrogance hurts. Arrogance hurts. Job says in verse 4, I'm a laughingstock amongst all of my friends. Why? Because all of this happened? Well, maybe, but you know, even more so than that, all of his friends are browbeating him. They didn't come to the rescue to his friends. They just ridiculed him. They said, hey, you know what? We know what's wrong and just simply look down upon Job. Proverbs 16 and verse 5 gives a very sober warning to those who are arrogant, and it says this, everyone who is arrogant in heart is it an abomination to the Lord? Be assured he will not go unpunished. Arrogance hurts. But notice this also, humility heals. Humility heals. Look at what Job says in, in verse 3. But I, um, excuse me, but I have understanding as well as you. I am not inferior to you. Who does not know such things as these? Job was crying out to his friends, hey, I I'm not some low life. I'm not some inferior to you. In fact, Job, if you looked at his resume, he was probably better than all three of his friends. He had more livestock. He had more servants. He had probably had a better and closer relationship with God than anybody else. But what did his friends do? They began looking down on him because of his misfortune. Let me give you a simple truth. Anything that makes you value others less is something that is corrupting your character. Anything that makes you value others less is something that is corrupting your character. Look at Jesus. If there's anyone in this world that could have gone out and looked down on anyone, it was the Son of God. But what does he do when he goes in and he looks at this world that was going to reject him? He goes and he, he humbles himself and he goes and he speaks to those that the society had, had rejected. He humbled and valued people and, that his society had disregarded or had discarded. You look at the woman at the well. What does he do? He goes and he ministers to her. The woman caught in adultery, the blind man since birth, the man lame lying at the pool of Bethesda. What does he do? He reaches out and helps them. Humility heals. Uh, many years ago, I was at a, a low point in ministry, and I remember Allison, Grace, and I were at the beach, and I actually reconnected with a minister I hadn't seen in a good long while. All the way back when I was in high school was the last time I had seen him. And uh, I, I got to talking with him, and he found out I was a minister, and it was amazing. He treated me just the same as he would have any other minister. I was in youth group with his children, 
And what did he do? He treated me exactly the same as he would any other seasoned minister. He valued me. He Now, he helped me, and he gave me advice, and he lifted me up. But you know what? Not once did I feel inferior to him, even though I know he was very successful. He was very well thought of, great man, man of God, and he did all of those things. But you know what? He valued. He was a humble and you know what? That humility, those little things that he did helped in the healing process probably more than anything else. Humility means we value people and we help them. And that is something that heals tremendously. Arrogance hurt, humility heals. But also notice this, understanding helps. Understanding helps. You know, it's amazing. Here it is that Job is out and, and he is hurting and not one of his friends comes alongside him and says, you know what, Job, I know what it's like to lose servants. I, you know what, I know what it's like to lose livestock or I know what it's like to lose family. Not one of them brings any understanding. In fact, they go in and they just beat him down. You know, one of the greatest things we can do is try to connect to somebody who's down to saying, hey, you know what? I just want to, I want to hold you and I want to, I want to hug you and I want to pray for you. And I understand what the idea of loss is. I lost somebody too. To be able to understand helps out so much. So the first thing we can do, the first action that we can take to help somebody and communicate comfort to them in times of need is don't be a know-it-all. The second is this, don't stop learning. Don't stop learning. Look at Job 12, verses 7 through 12 with me. But ask the beast, and they will... But ask the beast, and they will teach you. The birds of heaven, and they will tell you. Or the bushes of the earth, they will teach you. And the fish of the sea, they will declare you. Who among you, how all these uh, do not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In his hands is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. Does not the ear test the words as the palate tastes food? Wisdom is with the age and understanding in length of days. Job's continues to pour out his frustration on his friends, and here he forces them to understand the fact that they thought they knew everything, but in reality they didn't. They really didn't know anything uh, because Job points out from nature and, and everything else around him saying, look, the lessons I'm giving are simple. The things about God and, and his goodness, but also the things that go on in this world, all of them are, are basic and true with everything that is around us. And he, he goes to nature. He goes to the things that we see each and every day. And one of the big lessons that we can gain from this is that if we want to be effective in helping and ministering and, and doing God's work, is that we can never stop learning. If we get to the point where we say, hey, you know what, I've known it all and I, I don't need to learn anymore, that's a dangerous place for you and I to make, you and I to be. Um, because there's always something to learn. You know, I, I've got this Bible here, and I know some people have tried to... Uh, you know, figure out why, why do I have two Bibles up here? Uh, this is a very special Bible. This is a Bible that uh, is one of the prized possessions of my library because it belonged to Mr. Ralph Harrell. Um, those at Mars Hill know exactly who I'm talking about when I say Ralph's name. Uh, Ralph and Rosalind, uh, who have both gone home to be with the Lord, are uh, were, were dear saints and dear members of Mars Hill. Uh, Ralph served as interim pastor at one point, uh, at Mars Hill, and Rosalind served as deacon. Both taught Sunday school. Both ministered tremendously here uh, at the church, and both of them also spent almost 40 years uh, in Africa serving uh, as missionaries. And this Bible was Ralph's, and the neat thing about it is if you flip through the pages of it, uh, this was one of uh, the ones he was reading right before he passed, and I've looked inside of it, and I'm so glad his son was able, uh, was uh, allowed me to, to have it. Um, it has his, his notes in it. It has notes from Ralph, even though he was 90 years old, 
even though he had studied the Bible all his life and he was a scholar of it, and I know he knew so, so much more of the Bible than I did, he was still learning. Listen, there's always something new to learn, so don't ever, ever stop learning. Notice three things, if you will, just from the text. First is this, there are lessons continually all around us. There's lessons continually all around us. Verses 7 and 8 say this, But ask the beast, and they will teach you. The birds of heaven, and they, uh, they will tell you. Or the bushes of the earth, and they will teach you. And the fish of the sea, they will declare to you. Job says these things in a, in a provoking manner, almost taunting his friends, saying, Look around. This world is a classroom, and you are failing this class. All of the world around you are teaching lessons about God, and you haven't learned anything. Everywhere we turn, the hand of God is exposed, and the glory of God is shown. We read in Psalm 19, verses 1 and 2, The heavens declare the glories of God, and the sky up, uh, pro above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. As we are not able to be together studying uh, God's Word, we're not able to meet together. I know a lot of people have been out in their yards and they've been working and, and enjoying this wonderful world God has created. And I got a little challenge to you. If you want to continue learning and you want to continue engaging in God's Word and just kind of growing in your knowledge and understanding, look out in nature. Whenever you're out, whenever you're trimming the hedges, whenever you're going and um, you're mowing the lawn or anything like that, look around at the magnificent creation of God and pick one little thing out and look at that and marvel about the absolute magnis magnificent wisdom and intelligence of God. You know, for me, it's insects. I know uh, most of us hate insects, which I understand that completely. But you know what? Insects are a marvel. You, you think something like a, like a wasp or a dirt dauber. You, here you have something that flies around. It has a defense. It can fight. It can build. It eats. It reproduces. And it weighs less than a penny. That is the genius of our God. You know, we have a lot to learn. And we look out into this world, we can see how big and vast it is. And our Heavenly Father is even bigger than that. When we look out into this world, let us not forget there's lessons everywhere that we can learn. And we have a lot to learn. But not only that, we can look that God is in every facet of our lives. Look at, look at Job uh, 12 verses 9 and 10. It says this, Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. Job is talking about the sovereign control that God has over the world in which we live in. His hand is on every life, every person. Every single thing is in God's control. There's, there's nothing that God is not ruling over. And that, God, that means God is is in every facet of our life. And, and I say the word facet because it has a very interesting definition. A facet is one side of something that has many sides, especially those of gemstones. We think we, we go and we buy some, uh, a diamond or we buy a ruby or we buy, buy some, uh, some piece of jewelry at the jewelry store, and lo and behold, the, the salesperson will say how many facets it has. He's talking about how many sides the diamond, or ruby, or emerald, and all has. And you know, our life has a lot of sides. We have the life we live at home. We have the life we live at school. We have the life that we live at work. We have the life that we live socially. We have a lot of sides because we have a lot of different aspects of our life. But the reality is God is in each and every one of those, and he's in control of every single thing that is going on. You know, we might not understand it. We might be saying, God, you know, this, this part of my life right now is really painful, but you know what? God's got a purpose in the midst of all of it. Take this time in which we're not able to be out and about and do the things that we want to do right now. 
I heard on the radio the other day that they were talking about radio programming and what was being watched and what was being shown and it was very interesting. They said the one uh, one area of radio stations that was doing remarkably well during this time were religious stations. You know, even in the midst of bad times, we're hoping that the Lord is talking to those that might not have heard from him in a good long while. God is in control. And you know, that means a lot for us. Um, it means that God is there in every aspect of our life. And you know what? God's presence is a very, very important thing for us to hold on to. We need to develop that discipline within our life, knowing that the presence of God is everywhere in every aspect of our life that he hears all of our prayers, that his spirit is alive within us, that he is watching out over us regardless of where we go, and that he speaks to us in his word, that he is Emmanuel, God with us. And one of the most important things about that is if you talk to somebody who's going through a rough time, who is depressed, who's going through grief, who's going through sorrow, who's going through hardships, one of the biggest struggles, and Job himself is an example of this, is that he feels like he's alone. One of the greatest comforts that we can give as Christians is explaining and showing that God is with them. And also for us, in the very best capacity that we can, to go and say, you know what? You're going through this rough time, and you're going through this struggle, and you're going through this trial. And you know what? What I want to do is I want to go and I want to be there for you to the very best of my ability. So first step is, is realizing here, God's, God's got lessons everywhere. But you know what? Also that God is in every facet of our life. But also this, that assumptions can be very wrong. Assumptions can be very wrong. Look at verses 12, 11 and 12. Does not the ear test words as the palate tastes food? Wisdom is with the age, and understanding in length of days. Uh, what Job is getting at here uh, in these two verses is that the assumptions of his friends are quite wrong. Job has laid out his case that the righteous could suffer for a reason other than sin, and the wicked could actually prosper even in the midst of their sin. So he ends by saying, look, all of this is common sense. Uh, Eugene Peterson's The Message puts it quite well. It, it, these two verses are interpreted this way. Isn't this just all common sense? As common as the sense of taste? Do you think the elderly have come on wisdom that you have to grow old before you can understand life? Sometimes our assumptions can be absolutely wrong. We have to step back and we have to reevaluate ourselves. Um, John's gospel is a great example of this. Um, Philip, in John chapter 1, has found Jesus. Jesus says to him, come and follow me. And then Philip goes to his brother, Nathaniel. And he says, listen, we found the Messiah. We found the one the Old Testament scriptures have all talked about. And uh, he says, you know, come. And, and we found this guy. And he is uh, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel famously says in John chapter 1 and verse 46, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? See, Nathaniel's assumption was completely wrong. You know what? How about you? In your life, are there any assumptions that you're making that are holding you back from compassionately going and serving God? From going out and, and loving on someone and going out and ministering to the very best of your abilities. The first action we can take is don't be a know-it-all. The second action, don't stop learning. But finally this, the third action we can take to help us and try to communicate comfort to the hurting is don't try and tame God. Don't try and tame God. Let me read verses 13 through 25. This is a long passage, but what I want you to do is listen to a God that does not fit into the system of thinking that Job's friends had. With God are wisdom and might. He has counsel and understanding. If he tears down, none can rebuild. If he shuts a man in, none can open. If he withholds the waters, they dry up. 
If he sends them out, they overwhelm the land. With him are strength and sound wisdom. The deceived and the deceiver are his. He leads counselors away stripped, and judges he makes fools. He looses the bonds of kings and binds a waistcloth on their hips. He leads priests away, strips, then overthrows the mighty. He deprives a speech to those who are trusted and takes away the discernment of the elders. He pours contempt on princes and looses the belt of the strong. He uncovers the deeps out of darkness and brings deep darkness to light. He makes nations great and he destroys them. He enlarges nations and leads them astray. He takes away the understanding from the chiefs and of the people of the earth and makes them wander in a trackless waste. They grope in the dark without light and he makes them stagger like a drunken man. Here Job unleashes a God who cannot be tamed. Because in these verses, Job says some of the things that reveals God in a manner that doesn't quite fit with the system of thinking that Job's three friends has. See, the system of legalism or traditionalism that Job's friends had doesn't quite fit with all of these things. Because in verses 15, uh, it talks about God drying up the waters and then sending the flood. See, God is bigger than some system that says, you know what, if you do good, obviously the rain's going to be good. Or if you do bad, obviously the drought is going to come. He says, you know what, no, God is bigger than that. He's not going to be tamed by those things. The reason a drought would happen, the reason why these waters have dried up, because all of the, uh, anything that happens that way, it is because God's mighty hand has done it. Don't tr put, try to put God in a box. He's far greater and bigger and more powerful than anything we can ever even imagine. Job sums up his thoughts uh, in, uh, towards his friends actually in the next chapter. In Job chapter 13 verses 4 and 5, he says this of them, As for you, you whitewashed with lies, worthless physicians are you all. Oh, that you would keep silent and it would be your wisdom. He comes down hard on them. Job was sick of his friends saying, I know your problem and here's the solution. He's saying, listen, God is bigger than that. God is bigger and greater than all of those things. So the question is, what can we learn from it? Just two quick things and we'll be done. When we're trying to minister to somebody, when we're trying to help somebody that's in need, or we might be going through a rough time, the first is this, make God big. Make God big. Avoid the trite sayings and the canned responses that we often have within our Christian life. Make God big in power and might and ability. Say something to the effect of, Job, I don't know what you're going through, but I know our God is big enough to get you through it and restore you. I know God is greater than all of the things that you're going through, and I know he can get you through it. And I know he can even make, he's even big enough to let me be the friend that I need to be. See, that's the idea of making God big. I, I remember back um, when the Lord of the Rings came out, when Peter Jackman, uh, Jackson uh, released all of the Lord of the Rings movies, the very last one was called The Return of the King. And towards the end of the movie, there's a scene in which uh, there's a huge battle going on. And the, the bad guys, the evil army, is waiting for these reinforcements that are coming by sea. They're waiting for the ships to dock. And as the ships dock, they're waiting, saying, you know, when, I wonder when these guys are going to come out. Only three people jump off the boat. Gimli the dwarf, Legolas the elf, and Aragorn the returning king. Three very good guys. And they are staring down that army like they're going to rip through them like they were paper. It doesn't make any sense. Here it is. There's a, there's a thousand people ready to go against these three warriors. But the thing that they found out, this evil army finds out, is that behind Aragorn and Legolas and Gimli, there is a ghost army. And they cannot be killed, but they can surely destroy others. And they rush in. See, those three people had confidence in the power behind them. The same must be true of us. When we go in and we try to help somebody, 
We can't put God in a box. We can't limit God in his ability, but rather we have to make God big. But you know what also we have to do? We have to trust God's heart. Not a single person in Job's life had any idea what was going on. The only ones that knew were God and Satan and the angels. But you know one thing they did know and they knew about, and that was God's heart. They knew his character. You know, many of you might have experienced this or at least know what it is I'm talking about. And that is if you have a, have a little infant child or a little toddler, and they might be a little fussy, they might be a little sick or might be a little tired, they need to calm down. And you'll have a mom or a dad that picks them up and puts them on their chest. They might lay down on the couch with them and just lay there. They just might be, be there, and you know what happens in about two or three minutes' time. That child just calms down. And that child is quickly and fast asleep. Now, is that because the mom or the dad is comfortable? No. Is it because they're warm? Uh, not really. Do you know what it is? It's because that child is safe. And that child trusts that mom or dad completely, saying, you know what? Whatever might come, I am completely and utterly safe. And whatever I'm going to go through, you're going to see me through it. You know, that's the message we convey to anyone who might be going through a rough time. For anyone that might be hurting, that are in need of comfort, we have an almighty Heavenly Father who loves us with an everlasting love. No matter what we might go through, God is going to be there. God is going to see us through. God bless each and every one of you. I pray this lesson has been a blessing for you, and I look forward to connecting with you once again very soon. Let's bow in a word of prayer and ask the Lord's blessings on our time together, that he would watch out over us until we meet together again. Lord Jesus, thank you for this time that we share together. Lord, thank you for your word and all that we were able to gain from it. And I pray that you would help us to take these lessons, to live them out in our life, that we might be closer to you. Help us, Lord, that so often we want to be arrogant and, and think we know it all, but there's so little that we know. Help us to lean on you, to learn from you, that when times of trouble do come, we're able to present you as the one who is ever-present, who has a heart of love for us, that will see us through every difficulty, every trial, and every pain. For it is in Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen.